Garcia Toratori. I'm your grateful host, Dan Riley. Scrolling through my YouTube feed the other day, a clip caught my attention. I don't remember whose channel it was, but I was drawn to the thumbnail. It was a picture of an MSNBC commentator and the comedian Russell Brand. The thumbnail said something to the effect, Brand humiliates MSNBC host. I watched it, and oh my, he didn't humiliate him, he floored him. And from the perspective of public speaking techniques, and even more specifically regarding body language, literary, and rhetorical devices, Brand had a masterful four minutes. Four minutes that scream for some scrutiny. So here we go. First, some background. If you have listened to any of my podcasts, you know that I'm a student of propaganda. Though I don't watch any of John Hillman, that was the MSNBC commentator shows, or NBC per se, I am very familiar with both, he and the network. And I'm certainly familiar with the entire portfolio of General Electric Media Companies, for which NBC is a part. I also know a bit about Russell Brand, not as an actor or a comedian, but as a political commentator. In fact, I've never seen any movie he's acted in, nor have I seen any of his comedic routines. In fact, I first became aware of him by way of Fox News. He was among the many high-profile, self-proclaimed, far-left, progressive individuals that were constantly being used as punching bags on Fox News. I'm familiar with him today only because I've listened to him as an interviewee on several long-form podcasts. As for Bill Maher, I know of him. I've never watched an entire show of his. I've seen only clips of him when they're featured on other news sites. As a whole, I watch very little co comedy, and I certainly don't watch political comedians. To my way of thinking, Maher and his ilk are just political activists fronting as comedians. Okay, enough of that. Let's get into the analysis. But before I do that, I'll set the stage. The clip starts with Brand responding to Heilman after Heilman delivered a blistering diatribe about Fox News, that they are not news, but an evil propagandist network. The specific topic from which Heilman launched his diatribe was the revelation that some Fox News anchors were claiming privately amongst themselves that Trump was a whack job for believing the 2020 election was stolen while simultaneously giving on air while supporting on air Trump's claims. Hillman may have believed that since Brand is a self-proclaimed liberal progressive that he would be sympathetic to his point of view. He learned different. Let's watch the clip, then I'll do some analysis. John, I've not known you long, but mm. I love you already. But I have to say that it's, <laughs> it's disingenuous to claim that the biases that are exhibited on Fox News are any different from the biases exhibited on MSNBC. It's difficult to suggest that's, that's... that these corporations operate as anything other than mouthpieces for their affiliate owners in BlackRock and Vanguard. And, and unless we start to embrace, and, and also, mate, like just spiritually, if I may use that word in your great country, we have to take responsibility for our own perspective. I, I've been on that MSNBC, yeah, mate. It was right. propagandist nutcrackery yeah. on you're there. You, I went on the show called Morning Joe. Yeah. It was absurd the way they carried Good on. Good morning, Joe. Yes. Yeah, it, I don't it. know what it was. It wasn't morning. There was no one called Joe there. No one could concentrate. They didn't understand the basic tenets of journalism. No one was willing to stick up for genuine American heroes uh, like Edward Snowden. No one was willing to talk about Julian Assange and what he suffered trying to bring real journalism to the American people and I think to sit within the castle of MSNBC throwing rocks oh. at Fox News is ludicrous. My friends, Make my MSNBC friend. better. My Make friend. MSNBC my great friend. again. My friend, I would love I would the moment the moment the monetary right. you can win on Joe. Well, Russell, Russell darling, um, the moment that you give me a specific example 
An actual example. Okay, I'll give you oh, one. Right, just wait, right, just wait, 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 that we know that the election wasn't stolen, You've or something equivalent. This example, but I will go. I'm but I will go saying. out. But I will go out on television and say the okay. opposite. I will lie. Where's I'll, my answer? Wait, wait, give, just give me a give me the specific example. I'm just saying the basic point. Give me a specific I, 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 example. I, 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 all right, okay. I'm with you. I think it's a false equivalency, Russell. It's a no, it's not. I, I, that's I, your I, own bias. It's, it's a false. It's not I, about bias. It's a false equivalency because you don't <clears> actually know anything about any of these organizations you're talking about, even on MSNBC ones. Big fucking deal. My darling, you, it was more than enough. Up, you can't come it up was with such a you don't have a single, you have a single actual no. fact. Do you want an example? Yeah, Do you yeah. want an example? Yes. The ludicrous, outrageous criticisms of Joe Rogan around ivermectin, re deliberately referring to it as a horse non, medicine when they know it's an effective non medicine. Yeah, that, that's what not a Rachel example. Maddow turning up on the TV uh, saying, if you take well, this vaccine, you're not going to get it, when it hadn't been clinically trialed for transmission. You have to listen. Wait. Do you think you can improve response. America I by determinately and avowedly condemning Fox News without acknowledging that you're participating in the same game? I'm Did you not? Not just listen to Bernie <laughs> Sanders, someone who plainly legitimately believes in this country and believes it's possible to change, but is bound by corruption, is bound by the lobbying system. Surely it's clear to you, Bill, as one of the great pundits and experts and comic voices that systemic change is required. Money has to be taken out of politics. We need new political systems that genuinely represent ordinary Americans so that we can overcome cultural differences. And bickering about which propagandist network is the worst is not going to save a single American life, not improve the life of a single American child, not going to improve America's standing in the world, and the world needs a strong America. I'll tell you that. I'll tell you that. So you have an obligation, a duty, not to condemn these people. While people often use the terms uh, argument and debate interchangeably, they are not the same thing. But that's a topic for a, another podcast. So that we are clear, what you just watched between Brand and Howman was an argument. And in an argument, emotion is king. And he who can use their emotions to influence the emotions of the person or people they are attempting to persuade, in this case, Bill Maher and his audience, wins the argument. And Russell Brand won that argument hands down. Let's dissect how he did it. The first thing that stood out was Brand's superior use of body language. Like James Levin leading the Boston Symphony, he used rhythmic and flowing gestures for the entire four-minute clip. At some points, it was as if his hands were rolling or floating the words out to the audience. He also displayed a wide variety of facial expressions, raised eyebrows, appropriate head nodding, he looked Hillman in the eyes when he needed to and strategically looked away at Marr and the audience at other times. I'll explain why that was very strategic in just a second. And he smiled most of the time, except when he was making, a seri or making serious points. As for Hillman, he displayed mostly negative body language. He kept his dominant right arm fixed on the table and the gestures he made were with his left hand were predominantly defensive, mostly stop sign gestures as if attempting to stop Russell Brand from running roughshod over him. Other than sarcastic smiles, Heilman's face was mostly sour and angry. Brand added another la uh, layer of nonverbal communication, what is known in leadership parlance as dominant body language. Simultaneous with Brand initiating the argument, make no mistake about it, he, he's the one that initiated the argument, he displayed the primal move of dominance by keeping his spine erect and his head held high while Heilman is slouched. Brand appears larger and taller than Heilman, when in reality, Heilman is both taller and larger in stature than his Brand. There were numerous times that Brand made territorial claims on Heilman's personal space, I counted eight incursions of Brand going into Heilman's space and squeezing his arm, a clear demonstration of dominance. 
akin to an alpha dog approaching a dog dish, only to see the other dogs scatter before he gets there. Brand displayed other signs of dominance with his eyes. After he took the upper hand in the argument, he stopped making eye contact with Heilman and rather looked at Marr and the audience. As if to say, I've defeated you, now I'll make my points directly to them. Now let's compare and contrast the two with the spoken word. Brand was demonstrably more passionate. He spoke with a clarity, a certainty, and a conviction that were clearly absent with Heilman. He employed numerous literary and rhetorical devices. While making the point that both Fox and MSNBC are propaganda outlets with no significant differences between the two. He criticized MSNBC using a metaphor with a biblical allusion. They're throwing stones from their castle. Conversely, Hillman used a weak non sequitur to refute Brand's criticism. By challenging him to provide one example where MSNBC was claiming something publicly while saying the opposite in private. The truth is, Brand never disputed Heilman's accusations against Fox. His point was clear and simple that both networks equally traffic in propaganda. As Brand continued to give examples of MSNBC's biases and propaganda, Heilman repeatedly responded to each with each allegation with the loyally phrase that was non-responsive. While Heilman is interjecting his non-responsives, Brand is landing a flurry of punches and now talking past Heilman and directly to Marr and his audience. When he lands the sarcastic blow, it's time to make NBC great again. The argument is won as the crowd responds favorably to Brand, which, by the way, is no easy feat because Marr and his audience are very favorably biased toward NBC. Once Brand had the crowd won, he uses the popular rhetorical devices of anaphora, pathos, and ethos. As he moved the argument past MSNBC to more universal themes, themes that virtually everyone agrees with. An American that is bound by the lobbying system, is bound by corruption. He goes on, that will not save a single American life, will not improve the life of a single child. The rhetorical device he used, anaphora, is when the same word or words are used at the beginning of successive sentences, clauses, or phrases. As Brand is closing out his argument, he uses the classic Aristotelian devices of ethos and pathos while speaking directly to Marr. He says, This is clear to you, Bill, as one of the great pundits and experts in comedic voices. Ethos because he establishes Marr as an expert. And pathos by appealing directly to Marr's emotion with flattery. The clip ends with Brand using the simple but powerful rhetorical device of repetition. The world needs a strong America. I will tell you that. I will tell you that. Here are some closing thoughts. Even if Heilman had all the facts on his side, he still would have lost the argument. Not only because he was rhetorically outgunned, but because his nonverbal communication skills paled in comparison to Brand's. While I would concede that Brand most likely has had some formal training, I still believe acquiring nonverbal communication and rhetorical skills is much easier than you think. In fact, in most cases, these skills on a fundamental scale don't need to be acquired. We already possess them, at least at some rudimentary level, because we have been exposed to them since we were toddlers. We just tend to use them unconsciously. Now, if you want to develop these skills approaching a Russell Brand level, you can begin to do so by looking for them in your own conversations, movie dialogues, podcasts, etc. By consciously noticing rhetorical devices in speech, consciously observing the various types of body language, and by consciously noticing all methods of nonverbal communication taking place all around you, you will discover methods and styles that appeal to you. Then it's a matter of gradually incorporating them into your own communication style. And there is no need to learn the scores and scores of rhetorical devices with all those Greek names we can't pronounce. The goal here is not to write, 
like James Joyce or to speak like Demosthenes, our goal is much simpler. It is to sound good, like chirping birds in the spring. There is a decade-old video still available today in which people were interviewed after attending a Martin Luther King speech. One elderly but very charming lady was asked what she thought of the speech. She said, I have no idea what all those big words mean, but I sure love listening to him say them. Let me leave you with this simple idea. You're not looking for rhetorical devices so as to sound like Shakespeare, Cicero, or Caesar. Forget all that. You're looking for those simple devices. When you use them, people will say, I love listening to her speak. She sounds so good. Just sounding good in public speaking is much more important than people realize. And as for today in my part, that's all there is. If you found this message useful, please consider following me on your podcasting hosting site. Or if watching on YouTube, please consider subscribing. This is Dan Riley taking you on an odyssey into oratory. Until next time, throw off the phone lines, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails. We're on the move now.